Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Christian. Christian, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. So I'm Christian. I'm the CEO and founder of Normative, and we provide software for large enterprises to help them account for their full carbon footprint in their operations and quite crucially in their supply chains and I've been doing carbon emissions accounting for the past 10 years. And before that, I did maths and philosophy and artificial intelligence within academia. So that's briefly about myself. Okay, Christian. And why? Why did you set out on this journey? You had a nice, comfortable job, I got to think, in academia, working on maths and philosophy. What was the kind of uh, trigger to make you get out of that comfortable space and go into the world of entrepreneurship? Yeah, I feel like maybe you have some morbid type of of (laughs) self-hatred if you go into entrepreneurship, because being an entrepreneur is, is never easy, as I think most people will, will tell you. Yep. But it is also like the core way of having an impact. So within academia and especially philosophy, that's something that have influenced my life quite a bit. So even from sort of an early age, when I decided to become a vegetarian at the, at the age of seven, I sort of asked myself the question, like, why did I actually make that decision? What or the core values this type of decision was based on. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, when we got access to the internet, I started to Google around and and, and hang out on on Wikipedia and and web forums. I think I was 11 years old, 12 at the time. And I sort of found out that that decision of becoming a vegetarian, that was probably based on a philosophy called utilitarianism. So I discovered the philosophy of a Australian philosopher called Peter Singer. And he essentially argued that what we actually ought to optimize in society is the well-being of sentient beings. And that really resonated with me. Uh, And then a few years later, I found a paper by a Swedish philosopher called Nick Bostrom. And he argued that the main thing we should be concerned with if we actually care about the welfare and well-being of sentient beings is to reduce global catastrophic risks and existential risks because essentially they have the capacity of not just destroying us but all future generations as well and I actually ended up working for Nick's research institute at the University of Oxford but back then that was a few years before the Paris Agreement and some of the some of the momentum we're seeing in climate change, mm-hmm. and and climate change obviously being one of those global catastrophic risks that we're facing right now, I I sort of thought to myself that how can I have an impact on this, and then it sort of occurred to me that in order for countries to achieve their climate targets, it's actually companies within the jurisdiction of those countries that need to get the job done, and they do not just need to get the job done for their own operations. They quite crucially need to get that job for their supply chains as well. Uh, So that was 10 years ago. And and I thought that, you know, surely someone else is working on this. And (laughs) it turns out that nobody else was working on it. So that's that's why I left academia to, to start normative. And I think it's just a general pattern of externalities in general, regardless if it's climate or if it's pollution or if it's something else. Uh, externalities typically happen because if I have a transaction with, with you, I mean, if, if I buy your product, Tom, then that is logged on some sort of you know, general ledger, right? Sure. But there might be other effects happening to a third per- person that is not logged anywhere. And often those effects sort of happen deep inside and deep down in in the value chains and supply chains where they're invisible. So you need to make carbon visible in order to have an impact on the problem. So that was the core reason why why I sort of left the comfortable job in in academia to to start normative. And yeah, that that was quite quite a ride. And I think there's a few stories to, to tell in terms of entering into a market that is not fully ready. But 
that that is the answer to your question okay. i guess uh. yeah market making is never easy i gotta think right uh. but tell me two things come out of that a you mentioned supply chain and that's great given that this is the digital supply chain podcast but a why are supply chains so important and b just maybe a brief 101 on what externalities are in case anyone is not familiar with the concept yeah so let's start there so the concept of an externality it's, it's a concept in economics yep. essentially when two person engage in some sort of transaction that is obviously consensual between those two parties mm -hmm. there might be a third party or a fourth party or someone else that are affected by that transaction and they actually didn't agree to that consensually and they're negatively affected or that's called negative externalities when they're negatively affected and climate change i would argue is just one big negative externality because for instance let's say i buy electricity from you and you generate that electricity through coal power yeah. Yeah. on the other side of the planet that might contribute to desertification it might contribute to hor hurricanes where people have to flee their homes or it might contribute to wildfires that that are like actually killing people and killing nature so that's what an externality is and then i think the first part of your question if you could supply chains that. why are they important yeah supply chains so how I think supply chains are quite critical because often these externalities happen like upstream or downstream in a supply chain. And we crunched the data actually last year for the big UN COP climate conference. We're going this year as well as a part of the Swedish business delegation. But we looked at the data and because some people who are in climate circles have probably heard like the gap report that there is a gap in terms of commitments from countries mm -hmm. and we wanted to look at what are the commitments from corporates what do they amount to so we looked at 1000 companies with a net zero target and if they succeed in those net zero targets it would reduce almost 80 percent of global emissions so that's just a thousand companies we actually have 15,000 companies with some sort of net zero target. Right. So it might be that we have enough targets to achieve our goals. And that sounds like great news. It almost sounds too good to be true. <laughs> and when it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good for the, to be true. Because the catch here is that for an average business, 90% of emissions in their net zero target are actually located in their supply chain. So in order to succeed with those net zero targets that would bring the world to net zero, they need to succeed in decarbonizing their supply chains, which is a difficult task. Yeah. That is the main reason why most companies today are actually failing on their net zero targets. It's because they're having a hard time decarbonizing those supply chains. And those supply chains are often composed of small and medium-sized enterprises that have never engaged with carbon before, which is a part of this sort of challenge, making it difficult and one of the challenges that we're trying to solve. Okay, so to kind of put this in perspective, every company is part of a supply chain. You're a supplier and you're a purchaser. For a typical organization, you say, 90% of your carbon footprint, more or less, depending on the organization, the industry, et cetera, et cetera. But on average, 90% of an organization's carbon footprint comes from its supply chain. 10% doesn't. That 10%, the company can work on internally by electrifying everything, switching to a renewable energy provider, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the other 90%, they can't. But that other 90% is made up of companies like the original company, if they work on that 10% themselves, then they help reduce that 90%. That's more or less what we're saying, right? That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, and it sort of makes sense when you think about it, that it would be 90%. So let's imagine a laptop retailer and, and you buy a laptop from that retailer. There's a few percentage points that are like electricity or heating for the store 
but the rest is okay this laptop computer was transported it was assembled there were mining operations yeah. and all of those operations contributed a significant amount of energy and greenhouse gases so what you essentially need to do in order to decarbonize you need to have two things you need a way to exchange data with your suppliers mm -hmm. where that exchange is made as easy and simple as possible. That's the first thing. Then secondly, you need to incentivize decarbonization in some sort of way. And it could be either a carrot or a stick. And I think it depends on what type of supplier it is, right? You can say, we're not going to buy from you unless you have a net zero commitment. And unless you report on those numbers, that would work. You can also use the carrot and say, okay, it's a minimum requirement that you at least report the data to you. Now, when we know that you, their supplier, have non-renewable electricity and you have not electrified your vehicle fleet, and now we can put some sort of incentive for you to do so. It could be a carrot, like maybe we help pay and finance some of that. You know, maybe we give you a low interest loan of, of some kind. But none of those activities are possible unless you sort of build a network or a carbon network. So that's actually what we're launching officially this, this week, what we call the carbon network that have, we have been working on for several years to make that communication across supply chains possible. So all of a sudden you can make a concrete to decarbonize your, your supply chain because right now it's not concrete. So when a large retailers or large brands report on their so-called scope three footprint, mm -hmm. so scope three is, is basically the supply chain based footprint. All of that reporting is done using like industry averages and so-called like spend based methodology. So that means that, okay, if I spend this many US dollars on something, then I assume that it will release this mass carbon emission. The problem with that sort of methodology is that there's no way to reduce emissions. The only way to reduce emissions is to reduce spend, but, but you need an alternative. And that alternative is to actually engage directly with your supplier, collaborate with them around like, what can we do in order to reduce emissions together and be successful together? Okay, and tell me a little bit about this carbon network that you're talking about. I'm assuming that's to kind of close the data gap that you referred to. It's to have people on a, a platform where everyone is sharing carbon data and you have kind of a single source of carbon truths. Would that be a fair summary? Yes. So it's both the data gap, but there is also a business execution gap. So the data gap is not having accurate carbon footprint from your supply chain. Actually, something that we have seen and, and talked about like for a really long time is what we call the accuracy gap. Most corporate carbon footprint reports are actually wrong because <laughs> they don't take the supply chain properly into account. So on average, there's a gap or underreporting of, of 60%. So that's what we call the accuracy gap. But if you get that accurate data from your supplier, you can solve what we refer to as the business execution gap which is how can we strategically execute on our net zero plan? And well, if you have the data, you can, for instance, decide that, okay, we are willing to spend a bit of our budget to help all of our suppliers get renewable electricity. If they don't have renewable electricity in their grid, some of them, we might even finance the procurement of, of solar panels and installation of wind power or whatever it might be. We might incentivize them to electrify what they can electrify. But unless you have the proper data, you don't know and you can't like really close that business execution gap. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, it's, it's all about figuring out where to prioritize and you won't know where to prioritize on you, unless you've got access to the data. And to your point then, how are your suppliers going to know their carbon footprint? Yeah, that, that is a great question. And I think that's where we have failed. And I don't mean us necessarily. <laughs> I mean, we have failed 
in the world <laughs> to, to sort of make it appealing to suppliers to, to report this carbon data. And if you look at the sort of standardized supply chain questionnaire, it, it's often some sort of form that you send to your supplier and tell them, please fill in your carbon emissions here. Yeah. The problem with that approach is that they will have no clue how to calculate their carbon emission in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they will probably like blank on that answer or maybe make something up even just to respond to that questionnaire. So that's why sort of the industry benchmark is two to 3% response rate on carbon emissions for those questionnaires. Wow. And then even if they have responded, you can't really trust that it's the correct data. So our approach is not a survey based approach alone. It's also a calculation based approach. So if that supplier turns out to be like an SME that have never calculated their carbon emissions before, we provide them with uh, that core calculator so that they can report back uh, carbon emissions in, in a simple way. Uh, and if you're an SME, like going through sort of the step by step in our carbon calculator, like takes less than 30 minutes. And, and we, um, we actually started together with the world sorry, with the Women Business Coalition and the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we, we started an initiative within the United Nations Race to Zero campaign. It's sort of like SBTI, like science-based targets for, mm -hmm. for SMEs. So it's an official part of the uh, United Nations Race to Zero campaign called the SME Climate Hub. And the entire problem statement of the SME Climate Hub was to make it possible for SMEs to engage in carbon data. So we did this survey where we asked a bunch of SMEs, like, why don't you engage in carbon disclosures or net zero action? And most of them said, it's going to be super expensive. It's going to take a lot of time and effort. So what we found out is that the core reason is not because they don't care about the climate or that they don't see the business opportunity in engaging in climate. It's, it's more like a resources problem. So the fact that we do not just through our carbon network and the value chain engagement in our carbon network, we do not just provide like a, a survey, but we also give them the tools makes a huge, huge difference in terms of the overall response rates and actions that are taken uh, across our, our carbon network, because that's what we care about in the end of the day. Like we don't want to measure carbon for the sake of measuring it. We, we, we want to take like real action where we see reduction happening. Fair enough, fair enough. And can you tell me about any success stories you've had, any customers who've managed to reduce emissions or make some significant difference? Yeah, I mean, there is a bunch of these success stories so let me think who we should talk about. So, I mean, there is a couple of success stories. So we have um, someone like Eltel, for instance, uh, that have reduced their emissions. I don't know exactly how many percent, but they're sort of on the right trajectory to uh, reach their net zero targets. They've done so through electrification uh, of their vehicle fleet. So they do a lot of like installations um, for like telecommunications and so on. So that would be a big success story. Then we have uh, other success stories, um, such as Flying Tiger, for instance, analyzing. So they're you know, a retailer where they sell a bu bunch of items. I think they have 1,200 stores or something like that. Mm. And they sell like everyday items. And then by collecting the right type of, of accurate data, they could decide like, okay, it actually makes more sense for us instead of having like plastics materials here, let's switch to like other type of, of materials. So, uh, so those are just some, some examples. But I think like overall, there will be like more and more examples as we sort of probe deeper and deeper to in the supply chains. Because that often, you know, the problem is if you, if you don't have the data, it's very hard to sort of act uh, on it properly. And I, I think like right now we're sort of going towards the tier one. Our customers ask their suppliers for the data. Uh, but, but in order to really uh, expand the carbon network to all relevant uh, emissions contributing legal entities on the planet, 
we ideally want those suppliers to invite their suppliers and invite their suppliers. And then you have sort of these viral network effects that built companies like Facebook, for instance. So I mean, if, if our customers invite 10 of their suppliers that invite 10 of their suppliers, then that just needs to happen six times to cover more or less like every legal entity on the planet. And obviously we're not there yet, but I think like that is really what we're trying. That is the code that we're trying to crack to get as much data exchange as possible uh, across that network to make decarbonization concrete. Because in the end, we have the solutions for most of the problems. And the sure. solutions also give a good like return of investment. Mm -hmm. It is like solar power, it's wind power, it's electrification. We're starting to see alternatives way of, of, of producing uh, cement, alternative ways of producing steel. There is like the agroforestry and, and, and other types of more sustainable agriculture and so on. So we have all of those solutions, but it's just that the problem is hidden very deep down the supply chain. And so you can't act on it. But if you actually had the right data, you could make the investments and actually get a good return of investments. Mm. It's, it's not just like it would cost you, it would actually make you money over time. But unless you make carbon visible throughout supply chains, like that investment won't happen. And, and that's what we're trying to solve for. Sure, sure, sure. And if I want to have my suppliers report their carbon data to me using the carbon network, I send them, what is it, some kind of a link to a questionnaire or a survey to fill out. You've got this calculator, you said, which takes 30 minutes. I assume that's an online one. How does that work for them? And are they charged for it? Yes. So this is how it works for our like large enterprise clients. So we, everything more or less that a business do is encoded into the general ledger of that business. So you have like all invoices and business transactions. So if we work with a large retailer, we start by um, automatically analyzing all of the data in their general ledger. By doing that, we can figure out like, okay, which invoices are procurement of electricity or fuel for cars or things that release emissions in their own operations. Mm -hmm. Then for everything else, we essentially do like an estimate that, okay, you purchased like, I don't know, um, dog food from this supplier. I'm just making something <laughs> up here. You're purchasing something from this supplier and then we can sort of put a carbon estimate on top of that. And that's how you get a hotspot analysis. Right. So you essentially get a hotspot. What are the most biggest suppliers and what are the biggest categories of emissions from your supply chain. And then based on those hotspots, you can create an engagement program. So you can see what are the top like 20 suppliers that are responsible for, let's say, I don't know, 40% of my emissions. And then you can sort of decide to engage with them first, perhaps. So then you create an engagement program and that way you generate a link. So that link you can either put into an email, emailing the supplier directly. That's where we have seen the best type of engagement because it's personal. You could also embed that link if you have a supplier onboarding portal or some sort of other supplier engagement process mm -hmm. that is digital, then you can just embed the link there. And what the suppliers will get is both a questionnaire component if they don't have calculated the carbon emissions, they also get access to that carbon calculator uh, and they get access to that for free if they're a SME. So that's, that's how it works. And what kind of details do they have to fill into the questionnaire? So it's different depending on if they have like the carbon data already. If they have the carbon data already, it's what were the carbon emissions in your scope one, two, and three? Do you have like an audit statement for those emissions that you can please upload that so we can trust that the data is, is correct and accurate? If they don't have um, those carbon emissions, which is the case for like almost all suppliers, <laughs> uh, they get access to that carbon calculator. And then they, it's, it's sort of you know, a step-by-step -step 
of, of questions like what type of electricity do you have? What type of contract is it? How many kilowatt hours? If you don't have kilowatt hours, they can just say how much do they spend on the contract? And then we have like automatic conversions. We have like, you know, electricity prices for different parts of the world where we can convert the kilo spend to, to kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. You ask similar questions for vehicles, like how much do you spend on fuel or how many liters? So we try to meet the suppliers where they are because they might be in a situation where they actually don't have the liters or kilowatt hours or the more accurate numbers. So then they can just fill in the spend and we do the automatic conversions and it's sort of accurate enough. Uh, and then we do that for a couple of categories and it takes like 30 minutes um, or less uh, for, for a supplier to answer all of those questions. Okay, and if that supplier wants to then onboard their suppliers to go down the, the viral route that you're hoping for, do they then have to pay for bringing their suppliers on board or how does that work? So they could just, you know, it's like signing up for our a free calculator is, is free. So they can just ask, like, please sign up. But what, what they would pay for is sort of access to the data. So, I mean, if they actually want the data from those suppliers, then they would need to pay for our, our, our paid plan. And what we're sort of trying to do here is that we're trying to empower the smaller enterprises mm -hmm. to get their carbon emissions under control. But for larger enterprises that want insights from those smaller suppliers, they essentially pay for our standardized subscription. And that's our like overall philosophy. Like if you can pay to keep the network up and running and that network creates a lot of business value for you, then, then of course you should pay for it. But if you just wanna publish to the network and they get some insights for, for yourself, and especially if you're an SME, then uh, then it should be free. Sure, sure. And so for any smaller businesses like that, using a platform like yours means that it's easier, you would hope, for them to attract more business because they can now report their carbon data. Exactly. And they have this single source of truth where whenever someone is asking them for data, they just need to do the calculation once. Okay, and then if they want to reduce their emissions, do they then need to pay for access to their supplier's data so that they can work with their suppliers to then get their carbon footprint further down? Yes, exactly. So if they want to reduce the emissions or if they want to collaborate with their suppliers and get data from their suppliers, then they would pay for the for our sort of premium subscription. And I was about to say something else. But yeah, no, I think I, I think I answered your question, right? <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, no problem. And where to next? I mean, you said you're going to COP and that, and that's kind of immediate, but where do you see this all going in the next three, four, five, let's say six years, because six years brings us nicely to 2030. Yeah. So we have sort of a, master plan in a sense for how we can make a difference on, on the climate. So I think that step number one is just making it as simple as possible to calculate the most accurate carbon emissions baseline. And then step two, which is what we're launching now and what we have been working on for several years, is the carbon network where you can actually engage across your supply chain you can ask through our value chain engagement module for carbon data so that way you sort of have hopefully this viral spread across these supply chains and then step three so that's sort of the timeline that you were talking about like the next six years mm -hmm. we're building an ecosystem of partners across our carbon network and i think it's incredibly important to incentivize the right type of actions across any supply chain, across the network. So that's when we would work with banks and financial services industries and insurance companies and rating agencies and other types of actors to incentivize the right type of action. So as a matter of fact, like if you ask your supplier, like 
we want you to decarbonize your emissions, then maybe through this ecosystem, a bank in that region of the supplier is, is connected and they're saying, hey, we can actually provide a low interest loan for you to electrify everything that you need to electrify, for instance. Or if it's insurance companies, they might say like, we're willing to give you lower insurance premiums if, if you take the right type of action. Or if it's rating agencies, they might say, you're gonna be rated more favorably on the market if you take these right actions. So I think that is the next step of the evolution of the network is the rollout of an ecosystem that will really incentivize reduction. Talk to me a little bit more about that, Christian, because I mean, I can see why, but maybe people listening might not. Why would banks give low interest loans or why would insurance companies give low interest uh, insurance or lower premiums for companies or organizations who lower their emissions? So it depends on the jurisdiction of the bank and the jurisdiction of the insurance company. But in some places, such as the European Union, they're incentivized to do so. And I don't know the exact details of how those incentives work because I'm not a bank myself. But throughout the world, governments are building these types of incentive structures where financial institutions are incentivized to give loans or finance the net zero transition. It's all about incentives in the end of the day, but that's where governments play an absolutely critical role uh, as well. I mean, sure. the government, the role of a government is to set the right type of incentives. And, and those incentives could be, you know, incentivize the financing of the net zero transitions. It can also be setting carbon taxes. I mean, right now, the average carbon tax globally is five euros, or I think five dollars per metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions. That has to be 20 times higher mm. in order for us to achieve our net zero targets. So I think it's incredibly important that governments set the right incentives for reduction to happen in global value chains, for finance to happen, but also for R&D to happen. I mean, there are certain areas where we don't have solutions yet. Sure. I mean, we need to scale up the... Um, for instance, fossil free steel. So in, in Sweden, uh, they're also one of the companies that, that we're going together with as a part of the Swedish delegation to COP, like, but SSAB, they're pioneering fossil free steel. And the Swedish government is investing in this because they know that if Sweden can lead that globally, then like every single car manufacturer or train manufacturer or construction company will ask for Swedish steel mm. specifically, uh, which is a great business opportunity. And that's in fact how we managed to get so far when it comes to solar power as well. So I think some people might have sort of the naive picture that the price drop of, of solar, like the exponential price drop was just due to companies and, and free markets but it was actually due to relentless subsidies, Germany, and then later on China, to give the right incentives to produce more solar, produce more solar, even at the point when it was not super profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, but then if you make it and sort of nudge it in the right direction as a government, then eventually it becomes profitable because of economies of scale. And that's what, 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 what happened with, with solar. And I think electric cars is another great example. I mean. Tesla is, you know, rightly so, hailed as the pioneer within electric vehicles. But at one point in time, I think it was 20 or 25 percent of Tesla's sales globally were all going to Norway. Yeah. And that was all because of the electric vehicle incentives that Norway uh, rolled out. Oh, and if it wasn't for that, Tesla wouldn't have been what it is today. So, so I think all of those things are, are important. I mean, we all need to work together, governments and, and civil society, 
uh, and, and citizens electing governments that actually promise to roll out these types of incentives and, and then corporates doing the grunt work of actually reducing emissions. Cool, cool, cool. Christian, we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. Is there any question I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to be aware of? I think one question is what does the ideal sort of world look like? I mean, what, what does, the, does success look like? Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Do you want to ask that question or should I answer Just it straight away? Go, as if go you for asked it, it. Go for it. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. So I, I like this question because people sometimes assume that the ideal world is a world where every single product packaging and every single product on the market has some sort of carbon label so consumers can choose the low emissions alternative. That's not how I see the ideal world. The okay. ideal world is a world where every consumer can buy any product on the market and know that this product has not destroyed the world <laughs> or contributed to the destruction of, 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 of the world, hasn't contributed to climate change in the supply chain and in the production phases of that product. And I think it's sort of similar how we argue about most things. Like if I go to the store and buy an apple, and then if I sort of die of lead poisoning afterwards, it's, it's not that someone will say, but hey, it said on the product packaging that it had lead in it. Like, <laughs> how stupid are you that bought this apple? It would be like, but no, like no apples should have poisonous amounts of lead in it. Mm. That should just be the default. So you don't even have to think about it as a consumer. And that's the ideal world when it comes to climate change. We know by default that every single actor in the supply chain of that product did the right thing. Everyone went net zero so that you and I, when we go out on the market, don't have to even think about it. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Cool. Christian, that's been really interesting. If people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we discussed on the podcast today, where would you have me direct them? So I would direct them to our website, normative.io. Simple, straightforward, fantastic, love it. Christian, that's been fascinating. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, I had a very fun conversation. <laughs>